This is a resource of Just Loving God. Prayer, How to Control Your Thoughts, Part 1 of 3, from 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 to 5. So tonight I want to carry on on the theme of prayer, but I want to change tack slightly. And I've entitled this sermon, Prayer, How to Control Your Thoughts. And I have three short texts, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5, Romans 12, verse 2, and 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. So 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Or as the NLT says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory or with intensifying glory or from one degree of glory to another, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So I just want to pray, Father, I ask that you would demolish what needs to be demolished tonight. Father, I ask that you would speak by your Holy Spirit. I ask that you would fire shots into hearts and minds this evening. I ask that you would transform minds. I ask that you would give revelation and understanding of things that have been hidden to people, things that people have struggled with for years, Lord. I ask you to break them down. Lord, I ask you to give clarity and understanding of the weapons that you've given us to conduct this mighty warfare through our lives, Lord. And I ask you this in the mighty, precious name of Jesus. Amen. So who wants to think exactly like Jesus thinks? Yeah? Who wants to think exactly? Who would love that? If you could think exactly like Jesus, wouldn't that be something? Who wants to have power over your thoughts instead of your thoughts having power over you? Who wants to be increasingly free of being hijacked by your stinking thinking? <laughs> Who would like to know how to pray every time without your thoughts ruining everything? Okay, well, that's pretty much all of you. So today, I'm going to go through these three texts, and I hope express really clearly for you uh, what the Bible is saying to us about this warfare what the Bible is saying to us about our mind and our thinking, and what the Bible isn't saying to us about our thinking, actually. I want to show you how to have your mind and your thinking made new, and thus how to take every thought as a captive to obey Christ. And this will be by two means. One, you refusing to be conformed or molded by this world, and two, by contemplating the beauty and the nature and the character of Christ in scripture, in prayer, and in discussion with each other, and how to do this habitually, daily, without ceasing. You see, your mind isn't your problem. It's your old, unrenewed mind that is your problem. Your life flows from your thinking, from your head. It doesn't flow from your, quotes, heart, which generally people mean as your emotions. It doesn't flow from that. That's not where life comes from. Some people try and live by their emotions and they hit the rocks. Problematically, churches either tend to cut off the head, so it's, quotes, all heart, just experiential and emotional, or they cut off the body and they just leave the head, so it's all the head. You know, you can cut a chicken's head off and it'll, it'll run amazingly well, actually, without a head. They'll do very well. In the 1940s, there was a chicken called Miracle Mike. He survived 18 months with his head chopped off. He got so famous, he was featured in Time magazine, and his owner was making, we, we estimate, about 48,000 US dollars a month from taking him around the freak show circuit. He died, he, he choked on something 
uh, 18 months later, and he died. Poor Miracle Mike. And in Colorado, they still have an annual Mike the Headless Chicken Day. 17th of May, we just missed it. <laughs> but you see, doctrine without devotion is death. And devotion without doctrine is deadly. You can't just cut the head off and expect to just run around and it's all going to be fine. And you can't just leave the head and get rid of the body and think that's fine. You can't do it. So the head has to be adjusted according to God's way, has to be adjusted according to Scripture. We're rational beings. God is a rational being. He's made us rational beings, and he expects us to use our heads the way he wants us to use them. Who here has sometimes got intrusive bad thoughts, and you wonder where the heck they came from? Yeah? Okay, everyone. Sometimes they're just appalling thoughts. They're sinful. They're evil. They're even blasphemous sometimes against God. And they just come in and you go, wow. I was trying to pray or sing or something and just something just came across my mind or something vile. And there's a question that many people ask. I thought I'd quickly deal with this. They say, well, can Satan and demons inject thoughts into a Christian's head? Can they just put thoughts in your head? Can they read your thoughts? Can they hear your thoughts? It's something that a lot of people struggle with or just have vague ideas about. But I can tell you this, there is no scripture that proves that they can in the believer's life directly. There's nothing that specifically tells us from scripture that the devil or demons can just put a thought in a Christian's head whenever they want. And certainly not that they can read a thought. But the devils are clever. They are arch manipulators. And they can manipulate and tempt and influence us to create thoughts, I believe, indirectly, for sure. They cannot know the future. They don't know everything. They are not omniscient. This is very clear from Scripture. Only God is omniscient. So we know that. And you say, well, yeah, but I've seen mediums and witches, you know, saying things they couldn't possibly have known. Well, yeah, of course. Demons can know a lot by observation. They know what someone had for breakfast. They know they've got a relative called Keith. They know all these things. Of course they do. They also are experts in human nature. They've been tempting humans since the beginning. So they know pretty much how humans are going to behave. But that proves nothing about how much they know about our thoughts and what they can do with Christians' thoughts. But there are some scriptures that people say, well, it sort of points to this, doesn't it? Matthew 16, Jesus has just explained that he's about to go and die, and Peter tries to stop redemption. He tries to stop the atonement in its tracks. Bad idea. And Jesus turns around and rebukes Satan, not Peter. Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira come and they lie to the Holy Spirit. And Peter said to them, why have you let Satan fill your heart? John 13, 2, it says the devil had already prompted Judas to betray Jesus. So there are, there are definite indi indications that uh, the devil or devils can influence thinking in some way. But I think it's primarily from ourselves that our thoughts come. James 1.14 says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Mark 7.15 says, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. That's what Jesus said. And Galatians 6.8 says, the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. So there are very clear scriptures here that are showing that actually the problem is usually us. So I think balance is important in this. I think the problem is far more us than devils. Certainly devils do influence and they uh, do arrange circumstances to try and tempt us. He is certainly a lion prowling around seeking whom he can eat. No question about that, Peter tells us. In John 14, Jesus said, the ruler of this world is coming, but he has no claim on me. He has no hold on me. So the ruler of this world was coming to Jesus, but you see that Jesus had left no place for the devil. Notice. So I think our flesh cooperates with the world and the devil. I think that's the main problem. And the world and the devil, of course, try to pollute us using our own bodily desires, our own flesh. 
And of course, we choose to let Satan and his system, the world, culture, mold us sometimes. We allow it to shape us. We allow it to mold us. And this, I think, produces subconscious appetites and desires. You spend time in a cesspit, you're going to be taking on some bacteria, okay? And those bacteria are going to have dramatic effects on your gastrointestinal tract. I think these uh, moldings of culture create thoughts in us. And I think we give these thoughts time. We give them place sometimes, instead of the instant deployment of God's weaponry. And don't forget as well, just be practical, and be, be easy on yourself as well. You know, the human brain, if I say don't walk on the grass, if I say don't think about my shirt pattern, right, immediately you're obsessed with my shirt pattern and walking on grass. That's how human brains work. If we say don't think about this, okay, Lord, I'm going to pray now and I am not going to think anything other than this. And of course, you think everything other than what you wanted to think about. So there is a commonsensical issue here. If we get obsessive about that, we can end up thinking about what we're trying not to obsess about. So I don't believe demons can read your thoughts. Satan can't read your thoughts. He is in fact defeated. He is in fact terrorized by your submission to God. This terrifies him. He is absolutely terrorized by your repentance. He is horrified by your repentance. It actually frightens him. He's horrified and terrified when you draw near to God. Quite the opposite of what most people seem to think. Oh, the devil this, the devil that. He's so powerful. They're basically the devil's evangelists, some Christians. Well, stop talking about how mighty he is and start talking about how mighty God is. So pray out loud. <laughs> the devil can't hear your thoughts. Pray out loud. I know someone who prays in a whisper in case the devil's here. <laughs> Let the little vermin hear you. There is nothing they hate more. There is nothing they flee from more than the prayer of the lowliest saint. So pray out loud without fear. But of course, yes, the devil and demons can cause trouble. So you do need defenses. Proverbs 22.3 uh, says this, a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. So yes, be smart, be wise, understand his wiles. James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. And he's talking to the double-minded. So what James is saying here is, submit, resist, draw near, cleanse and purify, and don't be double-minded. We'll talk about this a bit later. There are also practical measures that you can do to avoid your body being influenced by sinful desires. Obviously, if you go to certain venues, your body is going to have a hard time resisting and dealing with what it sees. If you watch certain things, your body is going to have a hard time. There are practical things you can do to stop your body being subject to temptation and certain thoughts becoming a problem and thus hindering your prayers. And there has to be a swift fleeing to Christ when thoughts bombard you. You can't just sit there. You can't just leave it. You have to use his weapons. Prayer, praise, preaching, sharing with each other. They, these are the weapons of God. And of course, replacement. John Bunyan in his early days when he was bombarded with thoughts just coming into his mind, horrific, blasphemous thoughts. He used to sometimes go out and shout in the fields, no, 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 and punch the air and fight. But you know, what he hadn't learned yet was replacement. Instead of trying to fight it, replace it with everything that's true and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Philippians chapter four talks about that. So pray, draw near, repent, be clean, humble yourself, resist in prayer, and remember this as an encouragement to yourself. Temptation is not sin. Just remember that. Most people feel a temptation and they crumble in condemnation and guilt and shame. I cannot believe I was tempted to do that. Really? Who did you think you were? God? Of course you were tempted. But that's not sin, so be encouraged by that. Okay, so let's look at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. What are these weapons? Let's look at the weapons for a minute. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. Here's what they're not. They are not my anger. That is not a weapon of God. My anger, my revenge. If someone 
speaks against God's work here in this church, which they do, they have, of course. God's moving, the devil's moving. I like it. I want to be one of the 10 most wanted men in hell. Let the devils hate. But they, the response to this is not to hate back. The weapons that we use are not carnal. I'm not going to try and use all my skills and my reasoning to try and knock them down and beat them with arguments and prove them wrong and do all this. That's carnal. That'll do nothing for their soul. I want them in heaven. It's not going to be by strife or by striving. It's not going to be by my amazing problem solving or my scheming. It's not going to be by my talents. It's not going to be by my oratory or my being a good communicator. Lord, help us. It's not by my skills. So what are these weapons? Well, they're weapons that have divine power. You need to think about that phrase. You need to spend a couple of days thinking about that phrase. The weapons God given us, has given us have divine power. That means they have the power of the deity. That's extraordinary. You have no idea the power of the weapons God has given to you that are at your disposal. Preaching of the gospel. Last night I was at the bike park showing off my non-existent skills. <laughs> we met a guy, preached the gospel to him, shared Christ with him. You know, the power of the gospel is divine and has the power to demolish strongholds. Scripture, thirstily, hungrily, seekingly read, devour, study scripture. This is one of God's weapons, the word of truth. Prayer, and I'm talking about real, prayer-filled, fervent, persistent, childlike, happy prayer. This has the power to demolish hell itself. Time with the saints, time with God's people. This is one of God's weapons. I'll tell you, the first thing to go when the devil's after someone is he gets them away from the body. He gets them out into the cold where he can lower their core temperature. Just get them hypothermic. Get them going off to sleep. Hopefully he can kill them. That's what he thinks. So time with the saints is critical. Reading great books. This is another of God's great weapons. He's left us a heritage of godliness over the millennia for us to feed on and marvel at God's works and strengthen our faith. So that's what the weapons are. It says, on the contrary, they're not carnal. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself off against the knowledge of God. This is for unbelievers whose minds are darkened, and this is for believers. Okay? This demolishes things in every mind that need to be demolished by God. In the unbeliever's darkened mind, prayer and the preaching of the gospel, that's demolition. I tell you, you preach the gospel backed with, with prayer. Oof. That's demolition. You say, well, I haven't seen results yet. <laughs> you have no idea what that gospel is doing in that soul. You preach Christ. You preach eternal judgment. You preach the fact that they've broken God's law. The penalty is death, but there is a substitute who stepped in for them and took their penalty. You go and preach that gospel. You watch what God does. Arguments that raise up against knowing God your family way or someone else's family way. Well, that's just not how we view the world. That's not how we think of God. Okay, well, these weapons have the ability to demolish that thinking, the culture that has seeped into people, seeped into the church, seeped into the way we present the gospel or don't present the gospel or edit the gospel. This has power. These weapons have power to destroy these arguments. Prideful attitudes, this gospel, these weapons, they have power to demolish that. And in fact, anything that hinders knowing God, these weapons can demolish that. You have to start to understand this. You have to believe this. Otherwise, you will never step out. You'll never do it because you're just not really sure. You just think it's you talking. <laughs> oh, you need to understand. You're just delivering the invite, God's invite direct to the person. It's not you inviting them. It's not you talking to them. You're just the messenger. Deliver the message faithfully. Watch what God will do. And in believers, this demolishes habits of mind. Oh boy, do we need some habits broken, some habits of thinking that recur over and over and over. 
and cause a hijacking of our lives. Obsessions, cravings, compulsions, lusts, these weapons have divine power to demolish these. Are you aware of this? Do you believe this? You will by the end, I pray. Bad doctrine that's seeped into your head. You know, you run off and start listening to any old junk out there on the internet. The latest idea sounds really great. Wow, this guy's a great communicator. Oh, so it must be true what he's saying. But you don't have a Berean attitude and go and test. Well, I'll tell you, those, those bad doctrines can get in. Well, these weapons have the power to demolish things that have lodged in your head. So what about taking captive thoughts? People said to me, well, what, what does that actually mean? And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Well, what's captivity? It's imprisonment. It's forced obedience. It's a forced surrender. That's what captivity is. It's incarceration. It means it's no, the person is no longer free to roam. And you apply that to thoughts, it means that your thoughts are no longer free to roam. They are dispatched to a cell. They're controlled. They're locked up. They can't go where they want and do what they want and influence you like they want. So how on earth do you do that? 2 Corinthians 10 says that you must fight. So the first thing we know, this is war. Okay, if you're surprised that there's a war, stop being surprised because you are soldiers of the cross. You have been called to be a warrior of the cross. The way is narrow, it's hard. You're called to fight. I'd rather get to heaven with difficulty than hell with ease. Fools are willing, said Thomas Watson, that Puritan. He said, fools are willing for a drop of pleasure to drink a sea of wrath. Don't pretend you love Christ unless you're at war with sin. Don't pretend. You must be taking captives of your thinking. You must deploy God's weapons. You must take thought POWs. You've got to take prisoners of war in this war. If there's a thought that plagues you, that has to become a prisoner to the obedience of Christ. It can't just do what it likes in your head. But the first thing of all is you yourself must become a captive of Christ. You can't hope to bring into captivity your thoughts unless you are captivated by him. You have to become subject to his pleasure. When tempted, you must be subject to what he wants. When you're considering doctrine, you must be subject to what he wants. In every way, you must be subject to him. The human will must change so it revels in God's will, not resists God's will anymore. Your affections must be captured by him. This is a blessed servitude. It's not a hate-filled, chained-up servitude. It's not some kind of imprisonment in chains to God. This all flows from a love for your maker. Then, when this happens, Satan has no call on you. Just like he had no call on Jesus. He had no place there. He flees. And when this happens, your thinking begins to change. And of course, taking captives involves overpowering thoughts. Say, so, well, okay, how do I overpower thoughts? Well, with right inputs. If you don't put the right inputs in, you get garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. That's what you get. These are the weapons of God, the right inputs. Truth. You have to have truth in your heart. What is truth, said Pilate, and walked off. Huh. He wasn't even interested in an answer. But we have to have God's truth at work in us. It has to become part of our very fiber so that we know what is true and what is false. God's promises have to be in there. The word of God has to be in us. We have to be seeking him in the word. This is how we put right inputs in. This is how we begin to overpower thoughts. There has to be love in your heart. I honestly think that love overpowers everything. Love for God overpowers all temptation in the end. Yes, there's temptation. But to overcome that temptation, you have to love God. You have to have the love of God powering your heart. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said this, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. If you love God, you're going to hate sin. But if you love sin and the thoughts that you've indulged all these years, 
You're going to hate God. You're going to despise God. You can't serve both. And just being practical, you've got gates into your city, which is you. You've got eye gates. You have ear gates. First book I ever read as a Christian was Bunyan's Holy War. And it's about the taking of a city called Mansoul. And it has the five gates, the five senses. What do you let in your eye gates? Do you have a guard set on your eye gates? Do you have a watch on your eye gates? Do you have guards set on your ear gates? Do you just listen to whatever? Listen to any old music? Listen to any old people talking? Listen to any old preaching? You can't. You have to be strong to guard those gates because these inputs are what are going to make the difference in this war. And it's ultimately, I think, contemplation of Christ. Christ's character, Christ's nature, and who he is through prayer and through reading the scriptures. Without that, you have no hope of inputting the weapons that will demolish the thoughts that destroy your prayer life. I tell you, when you put these inputs in, wrong thoughts cannot resist. They can't survive long in this environment, in God's environment. If you put organic matter in acid, it's not going to survive there. If you put a uh, fire into carbon dioxide, it can't live there. It can't survive there. These thoughts cannot survive in you when you put this stuff in. So the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This is the end of part one of three.